joining us today. So we can all welcome her and I'll let you take it away. appreciate you having us. I know Lieutenant Enlow was here last week, so I'm here to wrap it up. I think he knew that it was going to be so beautiful outside, and he <laughs> chose me for this day. So um, I appreciate you staying after the church service and also being here instead of the beautiful uh, outdoors, but we'll get you through this in the next 45 minutes to an hour to respect your time. Um, so going into this last section of the craze um, program, this is kind of what you as a civilian civilian um, would like to do. Um, we're giving you these tools to try to better um, our response because ultimately if you really look at our response time in the city of Grand Haven, it's pretty fast. I mean, we are blessed to be right down the road. We have a large amount of first responders in a very short distance, which is nice. But realistically, if you're, you know, maybe out in the middle of Michigan, some other uh, rural area when it's just you and the response time for first responders is several minutes. These are actions that you can kind of do um, to help save yourself and others. So when we look at civilian response, we're gonna look at the three Ds that we had discussed last week. Um, so the first one's gonna be denial. We always get into that mode of denying it's not happening, this is not happening, that's not what I hear. And that's just our natural response as humans. Um, but we say don't deny, and we call it mental scripting, realizing that something is happening. Because the longer we deny, the longer our response time is going to be, and every second counts, especially when it comes to any type of act or shoot or event. So I'm going to see if this will work if I hear it, or if I do it. If you click on, are you guys able to click on the speaker? on the, uh, thank you. All right, we'll come back to that. So when you check on that speaker, it's gunshots. Now, a lot of times you would hear that, and a lot of people, the first thing they would think about is fireworks. But when's the last time someone let off fireworks in this building? Probably never, okay? Or a school, or Walmart, or Myers or wherever you're shopping at. When you hear those sounds, that tends to be the first thing that someone thinks about is fireworks. Why? Because that's a noise that we haven't heard before. And our brain goes right to the positive stuff. It doesn't go to the negative stuff. So you have to sit there and think of, okay, that's not fireworks. What is it? It's probably gunshots. And then you have to start to go on that deliberation stage. Now, the thing that you have to also be aware of is if the longer you're in that denial stage, the less time that you have to act. So gunshots here may sound a lot different. Gunshots in a cinder brick building are going to sound a lot different than maybe they are in um, an open area. So gunshots are not going to be heard like on the movies or if you're at the firing range, it's going to sound different. Um, what that different looks like is going to be dependent on the building. It's going to be dependent on the way the structure is made. Um, but start to put that unfortunately in your wheelhouse because this is the way the society is uh, getting to. So right from denial, you have to quickly go to deliberation. That's where it's, it's not fireworks, it's not someone that dropped a book, it's gunshots, now what am I going to do? So when you go to deliberation, Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, we'll, we'll go. Um, so for some reason, you know, over the course, uh, I've been at Grand Haven for 20 years, and over the course of 20 years, policing and everything has changed. You know, but back before all of these active shooter events, the first thing we always thought about was play dead. If you play dead and you act like you're dead and you don't move and you try not to breathe, then they're not going to shoot me. Unfortunately, statistically speaking, that is inaccurate, and you are more likely to be a target if you just lay there and play dead. Um, uh, Virginia Tech, which is a case study we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, a lady was shot in room 211 three times. She was shot the first time, and then she was like, well, I'm going to play dead. Even though I'm not dead, I'm injured, I'm just shot one time. She played dead. The shooter left the room, came back. She was playing dead, and he still shot her another two times. 
Um, and time and time again, all these case studies, because every active shooter event gets studied by the FBI and every other federal agency to determine what we can do better for our tactics, they found that people that play dead are more than likely to pass away because, you know, if that active shooter didn't shoot that person, they know, right? So, again, playing dead um, and hoping is not going to save you or someone else's life. We heard the first shots at around 9.40 a.m. Uh, I was sitting on the wall. Are you able to turn up the volume with that audio? Thank you. We have a lot of videos in these, this section. We heard the first shots at around 9.40 a.m. Uh, I was sitting on the wall of the classroom, so in the hallway, and I could hear the shots getting closer and closer very quickly. I mean, there was only a few seconds between the first time we heard them and when he actually walked in. To me, it sounded like um, an ax being taken to a piece of wood. And our teacher, she opened the door, and she peered outside, and she immediately shut the door, and she said, call 911. And right then, he walked in just seconds after. Um, there's absolutely no time to, to think or to duck or to take cover. And people just kind of fell to the floor. And he immediately walked in shooting. And he went to the other side of the classroom. And he started going down the rows. He went down each row very quickly, very purposefully. And I remember thinking, you're your turn is coming. You're going to get shot. I mean, I didn't realize there was an active shooter, but I knew something bad was happening. He came back to our classroom three times, and on the third time, he killed himself in the front of the class. In between each time he was there, you could just hear people crying and coughing, and the cell phone started ringing. Um, when he was in our class, I remember trying not to breathe very much, so he couldn't tell I was alive because as my stomach was hitting the, the chair, I was thinking, you know, he can see me breathing, he can see me alive, and, and that was very scary. I'll never forget when the SWAT team first broke in um, at around 9.51. The officer in the front of the classroom said, we have a lot of blacks in here. And at the time, I couldn't comprehend what he was talking about, but he meant triage codes. And I remember looking into the girl to my right and realizing you know, what black meant. He looked over me and he said, first he said yellow, and then he changed it immediately and he said red. And that's when I first started panicking. I still couldn't speak. I was shot three times, lying on my back. And I remember thinking, what do you see? Like, What can you see on me that I can't, that you would change me from yellow to red? He killed 12 people in my classroom, including our teacher. So that was Christina Anderson. Um, she was in room 211 of Virginia Tech. Um, she, we will talk about Virginia Tech a lot more because we've learned a lot as law enforcement officers um, and as civilians on what can be done to try to prevent the loss of life. So hiding and hoping. Um, hide and hope is not an effective survival strategy. You know, hide, it's, it's kind of like when your house catches on fire. You know, don't go in the closet and wait for firefighters because it'll take forever. Um, but hiding and hoping when it comes to an active shooter event, that is not an effective strategy. Most of you are aware that our products right now are not made with good quality, uh, you know, woods and everything else, right? It's cheaply made. So there's nothing that you can hide behind that would stop a bullet that is in this room. You know, standing behind the podium. Are you hidden? Absolutely. But it is an effective way to stop a bullet? No. Um, so start looking at some of these things. Hiding and hoping, it's not an option. Now, if you did hide, because that's your only option, what's your plan B, right? If you're sitting behind this podium or you're sitting and laying underneath one of these pews hoping and praying that someone isn't going to find you, what's your plan B when they, you are found? And that's where you have to start looking at plan B and plan C. We call it mental scripting in law enforcement because we always have to be prepared for the what-ifs. You know, we've got one scenario, 500 different ways to do it, and we have to work through our brain for that. And we're starting to ask citizens the same thing because that's not a good a strategy of survival because once you're found, then what? So again, hiding and hoping is not a um, good strategy. Now, when you sit there and go to the deliberation, we talk about avoid. Um, I'm going to use the word run, but avoiding is not always running and then deny, which is not always hiding, 
um, and then defend. So avoid, deny, defend are kind of the three things. So if all of a sudden, I'll give you an example, someone came through these front doors and I realized that person had something in their hand that wanted to create bodily harm to myself and everyone here, you know, what are our ways to get out of here? Yeah, absolutely. Is it important to know where your exits are? Absolutely. Even just, not even active shooter, but when we start looking at fire safety or even any type of situation and you're in a movie theater, a store, a restaurant, is it important to know where your exits are? Yes, and we're going to talk, I think you guys talked about that the first set um, with everybody going to the first exit right off the nightclub. So if you weren't there, most people go in, I came in this door, that's the door I'm leaving. We are creatures of habit. So start realizing what your other exits are. Um, I'm probably more paranoid. My husband and I are both in law enforcement. And every time we're with our kids, we always say, where's your exits? You know, this is so sad the day that we are living in society because this is what we're training our kids. Um, but again, so someone comes in here and all of a sudden we have several exits. Great. We've done the avoid part. We've left. Okay, nothing says we have to stay in this room. If we can run and we can avoid that person, then we did exactly what we need to do to survive. Now, if we can't leave and we have no exits, which luckily fire code says you have to more, have more exits in here, but let's just say that was my only exit, that same way that they came in. Now, what are ways that I can deny them? Well, it's going to be challenging because of all the windows. Um, and I can't see that you have doors on those, so it's all open. So it's going to be really hard to deny them access. The only way I could deny them access is if they were trying to come in here and I could try to somehow wedge the door so they couldn't get in. But if you can't avoid them and maybe you can't deny them, then the third option is to defend, which is fight. And I know most people are not trained to fight. I know most people aren't, aren't thinking they want to fight. But unfortunately, when it comes to life and death, the fighting has to be unfair. There's things in here that you can use, right? Everyday items. We've got this really strong, you know, metal music stand. We've got the stool. Most of you probably have pens, keys, you name it. Because in a fight for your life, it's not going to be fair. And I know you sit there and go, well, what if they have a gun? Well... I tell you what, there are story after story of random everyday civilians that are taking guns away from people. It happens. But what is it? It's a mentality thing. It's a mental, I'm going to fight for my life and the life of others, and I'm going to do everything I can to protect myself. And if it means going hands-on or having to use everyday items that I have to protect myself, then I'm going to. So that is avoid, deny, defend. Any questions on that? I know it's, it's hard to get in that mindset, but unfortunately, we're trying to protect society um, with the way it's going. So this is a, this is a school board, um, and this is a video I'll play in a second. It talks about situation awareness. So you're going to see them go to the, all of a sudden, the deliberation stage where these people go, hmm, something is not right, I'm leaving, which is the smart thing, right? If you see something going on, do you want to stay? No, get up and go, right? Remove yourself from this uh, situation. So this is a school board meeting down in Panama City, uh, Florida. A disgruntled husband, ex-husband, shows up at the school board meeting, um, and then we'll talk about how that transpires and what that looks like. But this is a great um, example of all of a sudden deliberating, coming up with a plan, um, and then executing it. Can you click on the pitcher, by chance. I don't know if it'll play. Here we go. technology to notice it's on the uh, chart that you have there, and it's part of the plan that we have that the workshop we're going to have following this meeting, but uh, this would be the first step in that whole process. I have a motion. Oh, wow. I motion to everybody in this room. Can 
you pause that by chance? Hey, sir. And for the technology that knows it's on the chart that you have there. So real quick, so it's hard to see and hear audio, but the disgruntled ex-husband stands up um, in the middle of the meeting, puts a V on the wall of red spray paint, V in a circle for vendetta, um, because he has an ax to grind with the school board because they just recently fired his wife um, and his insurance benefits and everything else like that um, got removed. So he stands up, shows a gun, and then if you can see in the video, everybody starts realizing, I'm getting out of here. But what do they grab? They grab their purses, they grab their bags, they grab their briefcase. Does that stuff matter? No, absolutely not. So it's kind of like in the plane when they say, you know, if we got to exit the plane, please leave your luggage. Same thing, okay? Leave all personal items behind. Um, and then what you're going to see is him with the gun, um, and he's going to end up shooting, I think, 12 times total. Um, but go ahead if you want to. Thank you. And for the technology to know. And for the technology to know it's on the uh, chart that you have there. And it's part of the plan that we have, the workshop we're going to have to follow this meeting. But uh, this will be the first step in that whole process. I have a motion. Oh, Okay. Everybody in this room behind that counter at the road. Hey, oh, oh, okay. Please, certainly you can Hey, sir. John, John, just let him talk. He's, he's, he's talking. John, go ahead. So, um, what you saw there is a lady came out from behind and she tried to take the gun away. Great idea, but once you have that mentality and mindset that I'm going to try to take that gun away from someone, you have to be committed to it, right? You have to just go 110% until that gun is removed. Um, and you can see she kind of went 50%, did a little bit. Um, you know, the more people that say, I'm going to commit harm on someone, there, I mean, there is a small... Uh, amount of number, excuse me, okay. So there's a small amount of people that will actually uh, commit harm on someone after they've said it. A lot of them are empty threats. Um, they're gonna show another video. This guy ended up 15 times, missed everyone. Um, because you have to realize when we talk about heart rate, which you guys talked about last time, the body's natural response to stress, they're also going through that. Um, and luckily no one was injured. A security officer who used to be a police officer came in and ended up um, shooting the suspect and taking him in custody um, after this. So it was all was well, but this is a great idea to show the deliberation, I'm leaving, um, because nothing says you have to stay in, that, um, stay in that situation. So even all of those board members, that one board member, he did a great job by getting them to talk. Because if you're getting someone to talk, what do you think you're doing? Yeah, distraction, stalling, allowing that time for first responders to, to show up on scene. So distraction is good because if you hear, the, if you're talking to them, you're also interrupting their brain and their thoughts, um, and they're not thinking at that time what they're doing because they're engaging in a conversation. So again, that was a great distraction technique. So when, again, leave as soon as possible, uh, know your exits, and then call 911. So this next one. So this next one that I'm going to show. This is a Jewish deli store, um, and you can see gunmen going in. You're going to see people leave, or you're actually going to see people that were going to enter the deli store and see kind of what's going on and go, "Yep, not for me." Um, so again, it's just being aware of your surroundings, being aware of what's going on, and realizing that you don't have to put yourself in that situation. So there should be two different camera angles.
So this was the other camera angle, um, and it's, if you can see it, so one of the uh, patrons ended up going into the back room, and that's what ends up happening, right? If your one exit, because the gunman came in, is the only exit, where's my other option? Um, and I'll just point out, so here's the door that they went in. What's one thing we can do? Deny, right? So we've got cases, metal racks, you name it, could be pushed up against that door. That will at least deny them access. It may did not deny them access entirely, but it may deny them enough access to waste time and take time for, again, first responders to arrive. Also, there is a door right there with a push bar. But again, we talk about stress and the natural body's response to stress. Um, and if, and it's not, there's a camera angle um, and there's actual like camera footage, but in the camera footage, she pushes above the bar on the door and she pushes below the bar on the door to see if that door will open, but she actually never pushes on the bar to open it. But again, that's your body. I mean, that is your um, indecisive, under stress, but also if you can see a ladder to the hatch. So she has several access points, but she just decides to go into a room and she does the hide and hope, which we said was not an effective strategy. So again, consider secondary exits. So again, deny, lock the door, lights out out of sight. When we do um, school shooting drills and lockdown drills in schools, that's what they do. They lock the doors, they turn down the lights, and then they go and try to hide. Um, and that's why a lot of windows have papers on them, things like that, because what are active shooters looking for? They are looking for the most victims in the shortest period of time before first responders arrive. And if they have to go to every single door, and that's what they do, is go to every single door and check if it's locked. If it's unlocked, they'll enter. If it's locked, they keep moving on because they want to get into classrooms. Now, if they come up to doors that are locked and they have to physically bust through those doors or shoot through those doors, that all takes time. Um, and so that's the biggest thing that we can do to deny access is to buy locking doors as much as you can. Now in here it's challenging um, because these are outward swinging doors, so very difficult to try to lock, but there's things that you can put in front of the door. You've got speakers, you've got chairs, you've got table if that moves, you've got all sorts of um, stools. If you piled all that in front of that door, can they still have access to that door? Absolutely. But are they going to have to fight, crawl over all of that stuff that you put in to get in here? Yes. And all of that takes time, which then allows us to respond a lot quicker. So barricading, heavier, better. Um, door stop. You know, you guys have door stops on these doors. Stick them down. You know, so that way when they're pulling, it just rubs on the carpet, creates that friction and maybe a little harder to get in. You have to start thinking about all these little things. Um, you know, for those exit doors going out, you have those bars on there. You know, take a belt off. If you took a belt off and wrapped around the door handle and then stepped off to the side, not in front of the door, but stepped off the side and held it like a like a handle and try to hold that door closed? Are you denying them access to this church? Absolutely. So again, it's trying to think outside the box, looking at your doors and exits and realizing what you have on your person or in that room to try to deny them as much as possible or make it more challenging for them to access. Because if they try to climb in here and there's only, there's no one in here or they think no one's in here, they'll just keep moving on. Because again, they want more victims they want their 15 minutes. So again, we're looking at, in this, the things that she could put up against that door um, that she chose not to. But we're trying to train the civilian mind now, instead of hide, hope, and pray, you actually have to do something for yourself. Um, go ahead, sir. So we learned last week that our heart rates are very high. Mm -hmm. So this is lo this is logical about putting stuff to doors. Yeah, because by now we know there's something bad going to happen, mm -hmm. and we're at 150 rates per minute. Yep. I, I, would, 
Are we still able to think logically and make all those plans? So this is why this is why you're here today, right? And this is why we we if you're thinking about it and you're starting to mental script things, and then we talked about like the tactical box breathing. He talked about that last week. You know, if you're starting to prepare yourself for this, then yes, this is absolutely something that you can do. Because um, if that wasn't the case, then first responders could never do this job, right? But we're always mental scripting, we're practicing, we're thinking, we're breathing, and we're able to do that. Um, and so I have the, if, but if you're just general citizen, has never been to a craze class, has never thought about it, thought that nothing ever could happen to them, and you've never thought of anything but your little bubble, then yes, it would be very challenging. But because you're taking steps to protect yourself and the people around you, then yes, you can absolutely do this. So, no, a great, great question. I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect, you know, some 20-year-old that has, is only about themselves at that age, right, um, to never think of anything, you know, that could happen to them to be able to do something like this. But you know what? There's always those people that rise above, and and you never know. So, but I have the utmost. Um, I think everyone here could do that. So, good question. So, simple door stops. You don't see a lot of these, but um, again, you can shove them under doors. There's also latches. Um, so, we talked about ropes, um, tension sleeves, belts, purse straps, you know, shirts, sweatshirts, you name it. Whatever you can wrap around the, the bars, um, it'll work. So they do make these latches. Um, I think it's a gimmick of someone out there trying to make money. Um, but you know the hotel latches? Sometimes hotels will have those um, 90 degree metal. Yep, that's all this is. Um, you just latch it over and it sticks into the door. Um, but I think it's up there with, you know, uh, 10 years ago they started making um, bulletproof backpacks. Does everybody remember those for the kids? Um, and that business has kind of gone under. But again, I think this is one of them. I think if you just start looking outside the box, because uh, this is an expensive thing if you actually look at all your doors. So. That all day we have met people who remind us what teachers do, how much they care even in the face of terror. And I sat down with a first grade teacher at that school, Caitlin Roick. She heard gunfire, large windows exposed her classroom, so she managed to rush 15 small children into a tiny bathroom to try to save their lives. I put one of, one of my students on top of the um, toilet. Dispenser. I just knew we had to get in there. And I was just telling them it's going to be OK. Uh, you're going to be all right. I, I pulled a bookshelf before I closed the door in front of it. So it was completely, we were completely barricaded in. I turned the lights off. Did you tell them to be quiet? Did you oh, yes. worry about one of them? No, I told them, I told them to be quiet. I told them we had to be absolutely quiet um, because I was just so afraid that if he did come in and then he would hear us and then he would maybe just start shooting the door. So I said, no, we just have to be absolutely quiet. Um, and we have, I said, there are bad guys out there now. We need to wait for the good guys. They're coming get I, I, I just, I wanted us to be okay. And I'm so, so saddened that there are people who, who in this situation are not okay. Um, and my heart, my heart goes out to anyone who knew them and was a part of their lives. I, can't, I just can't imagine. Did they cry? No, if they started crying, I would like take their face and say, it's going to be okay. Show me your smile. Like, I really tried to like, ha you know, and one of my students was, you know, would say like things like, I know karate, so it's okay. I'll lead the way out. Like, they really said to you, we want to go home for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to hug my mom or just, you know, things like that that were just, just heartbreaking, you know. And like in my mind, I mean, because you're hearing... I've never been a part of something, obviously, anywhere near this traumatic. Um, and so I'm hearing the gunfire in the hallway, and I'm thinking in my mind, I, I'm the first classroom. Why isn't he coming? You know, I'm thinking, we're next. And, you know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, as, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, what, what are your thoughts? What are your, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that I have to, to almost be their parent. Like, I have to tell them, you know. So I said to them, I said, I need you to know that I love you all very much and that it's going to be okay, because I thought that was the last thing they were ever going to hear. I thought we were all going to die. Um, 
you know, and I don't know if that's okay, you know, teachers and, you know, but I wanted them to know someone loved them and I wanted them, that to be one of the last things they heard. Uh, not, not the gunfire in the hallway. Uh, it's just so horrible, it's so horrible. Horrible, horrible. Um, How did you know you were going to be okay? What happened? I didn't. Um, what finally happened was the gunfire stopped. The gunfire wasn't um, that long, um, so that stopped. But I, st I said, no, we're not going right. anywhere. We're right. staying here um, until someone good comes in. Um, sorry, gets us out. So eventually, what happened was the police came and started knocking. Um, and obviously, I mean, I was completely beside myself. And I said, I don't, I don't believe you. Um, you need to put your badges under the door. Um, so they put their badges under the door. I said, if you're really a police officer, then you would have a way to get in here. You would have a key, or you would have gotten it from the jan. If everything's okay now, you would have found the keys. So he had keys, and he found the right one, and he unlocked the door. And then they brought us out to the um, firehouse to meet up with the rest of um, the teachers and students, waiting for parents to come and pick them up. I think there are a lot of people who wish. So this is just a play on your question, sir, is, you know, these teachers are trained and they go through the same training that you're going through right now. And we also follow up with lots of other training just in the school system. So they're ready and they're trained for it. Um, and, and you can see time and time again how many stories, you know, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, um, a lot of teachers are becoming heroes because they're doing exactly what they need to do. They've trained it, they've mentally scripted it, and they're ready for it. Um, Sandy Hook came out with a lot of hero teachers because of the amount of children that actually were saved that day. Um, you know, there's teachers that literally stood in front of their children and took the bullet. There's the other teacher that stuck all their kids, stacked them up in a closet, um, and tried to tame a bunch of five, six, seven year olds. Um, they did a phenomenal job. So, again, it's it's because they were hopefully trained, but also being prepared. It's just the sad day our society is in right now. So real quick, we're going to look at defend and fight um, positioning. Now, if someone came through this door with a gun, a knife, whatever it is, do you think I'm better off protecting myself here or close to the door? Close to the door, right? Because I'm not going to be able to run 25 feet to take a gun from someone. So. You know, this is where I always say you need people that will also protect with you. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to admit this, I probably bring about 10 to 15 pens on a plane with me um, because I know that I will be able to find 10 to 15 people that will also protect those people on that plane with me with simple pens. I know it sounds weird, but this is just the way our society is getting. So if someone's coming through this door, we've got it barricaded but not well enough for them not to enter. And I know that someone's coming through here. This is probably not the best area, okay? This would probably be the better area because if they enter, at least they may not see me well enough, but at least I can jump out and get them. Um, so again, if you're going to defend yourself and everybody else in that room, you're gonna have to bridge that gap. You're gonna have to get close um, and know that it's not going to be fair. You have to fight for your life um, and you have to shift that emotion. Someone is trying to hurt you. We all have emotions. We're scared, we're fearful, we're happy. You anger, we all have emotions and they are valid emotions. But you have to be able to switch that fear emotion and scared emotion and switch it to anger real quick and realize that someone is trying to hurt you and your family. Because if you are gonna try to protect yourself and someone else just based on the fear emotion or scared emotion, then the chance of you being successful is going to be very minimal. And you gotta switch to that anger because it is going to be a fight for your life. Um, and again, we talked about things that you have on your belt or your purse, in your pocket, you name it, keys, anything else you're gonna have to use against them. So again, shifting those emotions. So this is a good example. This is a um, deli store. You can see this gentleman right here. He decides to shift to, okay, what can I use around me as a weapon? And then you're gonna see another lady in this video that does the, I'm gonna play dead, so. So he grabs the wine bottle thinking that he can use it as a weapon, which is a great idea. I love that fact that he's coming to play on B. And then he, instead he realizes, hmm, I'm just going to get out of here. And then you've got the girl in the blue coat that says, I'm just going to play dead.
So he ends up um, getting out of there, but great, right? I mean, if that's what you can grab and you can run out at the same time, but at least have that weapon in your hand, why not, right? That is coming up with plan B. The lady that just laid down on the ground, not a good idea. I mean, these, these people that commit these acts, I mean, obviously they're going through a lot of mental illness, they're going through a lot in their head, but they're gonna know if they shot down that aisle. So this is Lieutenant Brian Murphy. I'm just going to read it verbatim. I'm not going out in a parking lot. I'm not going out like this. I'm not going to let my wife down. I'm not going to let my daughter down. And I'm not letting my stepkids down. So Lieutenant Brian Murphy, he was the first responder for a temple shooting in Wisconsin. So call came out. Um, a uh, gentleman went into uh, the temple, started firing, um, ended up cornering a bunch of people in a kitchen. Um, and could have lost a lot of lives that day. Ended up uh, shooting and wounding and killing some. Ended up going into the kitchen. Well, the kitchen had windows overlooking the parking lot. Saw Lieutenant Brian Murphy show up in his police car, distracted him, and the uh, suspect says, I'm going to go engage the officer first before I go back in. Goes out into the parking lot. Lieutenant Brian Murphy steps out of his car, and that's where he is met with uh, gunfire. First one, he gets shot in the head. Um, the other one, the thumb, and he ends up getting shot 15 times. If you can see it, the amount of scars, um, 15 times, and he ended up shooting back and killing the suspect. Um, and he survived, and he lives to tell about it to this day. And we talk about warrior mindset. We talk about that mentality um, of not giving up and fighting through it, and that is a great testament to that. Um, but he obviously is no longer uh, on the police force. Um, he does a lot of public speaking and going around traveling about motivational speaking. Um, but that is just the will to not give up and to live. And he fought for a long time um, until other officers could end up showing up. But yeah, Lieutenant Brian Murphy shot 15 times. So again, just to reiterate the avoid, deny, and defend, knowing your surroundings. So what you do matters. You may not think it, but it does. I mean, with everything, right? Um, but even just by putting something in front of that door to have someone trip over it to try to enter this room, that may have taken 20 seconds. But again, that's 20 seconds that allows those first responders to get here. Um, you know, we're fortunate, again, in, in Grand Haven, and I will say Ottawa County, I mean, because we all respond everywhere. Um, other areas aren't as fortunate as that, but you have to realize that our priorities are to come in and get the um, suspect, okay? Unfortunately, it's not 10 to the medical, 10 to the people, um, but everything that you do up to that point is going to matter, not just for you or anybody else, um, but every second counts. So when you look at it, so we'll go, we like flow charts. It's easy to read. So let's just say the attack starts. What are your exits? Okay, we said attack starts coming in here. Our exits are that door and these two doors. Can you get out through there? Okay, so we have lots of exits. Okay, so if we have exits, then run. If we don't, then we're going to have to deny and hide. Now, I'm not saying to all of a sudden just go hide, but we have to deny them access at some point. So if you have time, deny them access and then go hide. Just don't go hide. So if you have uh, deny hide, other exits, avoid run, no, and then we're going to have to defend. So those are the kind of three steps. I don't want anyone ever to play the hero, right? If you can exit, then exit. Okay, don't be that person that stays in that room to try to play hero when you can leave and go save yourself or someone else. Um, that's not your job. We don't asked to put yourself in harm's way. Um, so if you can exit, please do so. So we're going to look at Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech is a great case study um, to show what it looks like when you actually defend someone um, versus not defending. So this is Norris Hall. This is the um, hall that all the classrooms were taking place. So just to show you the outside of it, uh, the Virginia Tech shooter, he went and shot two people um, at a dorm. That was heavy presence, police presence, um, and then he ended up going to Norris Hall. So this is the second floor, so you can kind of see the layout. There's rooms kind of across and, and kitty corner from each other. 
So this is how the rooms are set up. And I want to get the information right because um, so the suspect entered the room in 206 and then 207 and then 211. Um, person in 211 was shot, 11 killed, six wounded. Um, and then the third room that was attacked, he re revisited. So in room 204, uh, in 204, he ended up removing his, so they all got out by the window. So green is alive. So green's alive, yes, thank you. So green's alive, red is obviously passed away, and yellow is injured. So the person in 204, um, he was a um, Holocaust survivor, and he ended up putting himself in front of the door and ended up getting as many class or of his students out the window. So that's the number that unfortunately is him that passed away. Um, in 206, uh, or I'm sorry, 207, this was the class that ended up, why isn't my green? There we go. So in 205, this is the one where they actually all lined up. So if this was an enclosing door, all the students laid on top of each other lower and they put their feet against the door and they did it to about this high and they had like 15 feet up against this door and they so that way that suspect could not enter um, and that's how they denied the door now suspect shot through the door but where do you think suspect shot all up here not down here um, so everybody ended up surviving in 205 and he never made um, entr entry into 205 um, so the teacher in room 211, um, the shooter pushed in the way and the, he walked, he pushed in 211 right here. So this was the first room that he attacked um, and he literally just walked in and they had no chance, unfortunately. Um, the people in 206 is the one that uh, uh, Christina was in that we heard earlier. Um, they're the one that he went in, they went into 211, went into 206, went in, shot, but then left and then started going to 207, 205, found that he was being denied access, and then decided to go back to 206 because it was easy targets, and that's where a lot of the people ended up playing dead. So you can see um, where 211 and 206 had the most fatalities is because they weren't the ones that fought back. So these other rooms are the ones that fought back as much as they could. So. Again, it shows that denying access to a room as much as you can, either by fighting or denying the door, locking the door, putting stuff up against the door, it does save lives. So the casualties for Virginia Tech, just to show you, um, these three, so they denied, they denied, they denied, um, and then these two, they had did nothing. So it's a good illustration of why we have to do something. We just can't be, um, for lack of a better word, easy targets. So when the, we arrive, just to give you kind of an idea, um, is we have to treat everyone. We don't know, right? We're just getting dispatch information. We don't really know who's the shooter. We don't know if there's multiple people involved. We don't know if there's anyone behind the scenes. Um, and our first priorities is going to be to uh, get the situation under control, which is by finding the suspect and taking care of that situation. And then we can kind of filter through to treat the uh, injured. Now, if we come into a room, you know, follow commands, right? You're gonna see a video where we're giving commands of put your hands up, you know, single file, just follow commands, that's the biggest thing. We want to see hands for obvious reasons. Um, if we tell you don't move, then don't move, right? And it's going to be a scary situation. It's not, we're trying to be mean. It's not like we're trying to be rude. Um, it's just more or less just trying to give everyone, um, you know, to know that you're not a suspect. You're not having anything on you. Um, and just to try to give more of an orderly fashion. Because um, that's our focus right there. Okay. Um, they do have this program called Stop the Bleed. Um, it's a program for tourniquets because what they're finding is um, the tourniquets is something that goes um, on arms and legs um, to try to stop the arteries from bleeding because that's what's happening um, is these uh, active shooter incidents are taking a long time 
and the blood supply they're losing and they're passing away. It's not because of the injury, but the blood supply. So we're now trying to teach schools, buildings, commercial, manufacturing, whoever, um, tourniquet training because we want people to know how to use them. Because you may be in a room with someone for an hour before we can get to you. Um, and so if we can teach people on how to apply these tourniquets to stop the bleeding, to reduce the loss of uh, lives, um, that's what we're doing. I mean, they teach it in the schools, in high school level, um, pretty much across, across the country at this point. So, again, it's sad, right? I mean, you would never think 20, 30 years ago we'd ever have to teach this, but this is what we're doing. So just a quick video of when we arrived. This is a, a video of an active shooter um, event, and you can hear the officer give commands. Are you ready? If you're not cool, I'm not walking with you. Thank you, thank you. Try to relax, everyone. Try to relax. I'll take a bullet before you do. That's for damn sure. Just be cool, okay? So you can just kind of hear the instruction. Um, I will tell you the officer or the uh, uh, teacher in Sandy Hook when she asked for the badge under the door. Um, realistically, we don't carry 30 badges on us. Um, but if you are ever in a situation, and, and I hope you're never in a situation, I hope this is just information that you can take with you and never use it. Um, but if you're ever in a situation and you're ever curious on who's the other side of the door, you know, ask for badge number, ask for business cards. You're probably more likely to get a business card slid under that door than probably a badge, because again, we don't have very many. Um, but we also like respond from home on our off days. I mean, if we had something going on right now in the city, I can guarantee that all of my patrol, all of my sergeants, all of my command staff, Ottawa County, MSP, even off-duty officers would be there in a heartbeat. Um, and they're not carrying their badges on them. They're probably not carrying their business cards on them. Um, but if you're ever concerned on who's out of the other side of the door, then call 911, right? Can you call a dispatcher on 911 and say, hey, there's an officer outside my door. Um, can you verify it's him? That's an easier way. Um, the school shooting over in Detroit, um, over on the east side, a couple years back, um, there's a social media video because when you're in an active shooter, what's the first thing these kids do? Put it on social media, right? Um, but it's actually a great video. It's not embedded to this, um, and it should be, because what it is is these kids are in their classroom, and active shooter situations taking place, and all of a sudden, knock on the door, and he's like, it's the police, open up. And uh, the kids start asking questions. Well, what's your badge number? What's your name? Start questioning them, and all of a sudden, he starts giving bad information, and they're like, Nope, that's not him. We'll come to find out. It was the active shooter on the other side of that door pretending to be a police officer, um, and those kids ended up getting out the window. And so it, it's all filmed, because, of course, why wouldn't you film that on social media? Um, but it's a great example um, of how these suspects are becoming a lot more trickier, um, but we just have to have more common sense. So, again, I don't want you to think we can throw badges under doors, so that's not realistic. Bless you. Um, so just the medical aspect, you can obviously know there's a delay. Uh, we train uh, being paramedics and EMTs. Unfortunately, we even have to bypass. Um, we have to step over victims to get to that shooter. Um, you know, we may throw a tourniquet or something at you, but if you've never used it, it doesn't really work, right? Um, our paramedics, um, any of our fire departments, they will not go in unless that situation is cleared, taken care of, and it's no longer a threat. Um, so this is why knowing any type of medical training, knowing that pressure um, to stop bleeding, things like that will be beneficial, but that's why a lot of lives end up getting lost, not just because of the wounds, um, but because unfortunately the amount of uh, blood loss until we can get medical in there. So, so this is that stop the bleed. Um, it is a, it's a course, it's pretty basic, um, but it just goes for tourniquets. Has anybody ever seen a tourniquet or know what tourniquets are? Do you guys have them here at all? No, in first aid kits? No. 
Okay. So they actually uh, were created by the military. The military created it because they found that um, when they were overseas and uh, soldiers were getting injured, and it would take you know six hours of a helicopter ride to get them somewhere, it wasn't necessarily the injury that was losing their lives, it was because of the amount of blood loss. And so they created tourniquets, they were the guinea pigs, and found them to be very successful. Um, and then obviously it filtered over to America, and they're very popular. Um, and this is probably the biggest thing, right, is uh, personal issues after these active shooter events. Um, you have to respect them and you have to understand they are going to happen. If you are in an incident, um, realize that there's help out there for you. You know, as a church, if something were to happen here, that would be something that, as a church, you would have to have some type of grief team, counseling, therapy, um, something for the victims and the people affected by it um, because this is a long-term battle um, for people that are affected. You know, most, uh, if you look at 9-11, um, most of the officers and first responders have retired um, or quit, most of them. You know, a lot of these teachers are no longer teaching at Sandy Hook. Um, a lot quit after Columbine because this is, our brains are not meant um, to see that and, and feel that, right? So that's why I like PTSD for a lot of our military soldiers and things like that, because our brains aren't meant to see that stuff. So again, just know that you're going to have that mental trauma and we're going to have to deal with that. So if you've noticed last week and this week, we haven't said one suspect's name, right? We use either suspect um, or them, they, because we are so tired of giving them their 15 minutes of fame. Social media, the news does a great job putting their photos and names all over. Um, and I really think if we actually took away that, we'd probably have less um, active shooter events. I worked for the Attorney General's office um, for a few years doing consumer protection um, and uh, okay to say, things like that, to try to prevent a lot of this. And I couldn't tell you when we have an active shooter situation, we've got 300 tips coming in for the state of Michigan as copycats. Because these kids see that publicity and they go, oh, I want that, I want that notoriety. And then they start calling in a bunch of copycat active shooters, threats on schools. Um, it's sad, we have them here. Um, we're not immune to it here in Grand Haven. We're not immune to it in Spring Lake. Um, and it is just as live as it is here as it is in Florida. So again, we just don't name them. But the people we do name, um, so this is Victoria Soto. She was a teacher for uh, Sandy Hook, and she actually stood in front of her uh, five and six-year-olds in her classroom, um, shielding them. So she passed away to save the lives of her students. But you wouldn't know who that is. But if we showed you the pictures of the shooters with some of these events, you'd be like, oh yeah, I recognize them. So again, this is the way our society has shifted. We're giving notoriety to the people that we shouldn't be giving to. So this is a gym teacher, uh, Angela McQueen. She was a physical education math teacher. Um, and she ended up taking a gun away from someone. So she took a gun away from, he was an eighth grade boy, um, to try to, and she prevented a school shooting. So when I say that you can take a gun away from someone, you can. Um, I teach hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, and control tactics instructor. I teach at the police academies at Grand Valley. Um, and if I can train them to take a gun away, I know the general population can take a gun away. So, but again, you would never know who this person is because her name's not blasted all over social media. So um, these are the four topics that we have discussed. Any questions? Try to make it short and sweet. Yes, sir. We've listened to you. Mm -hmm. And we comprehended this. Mm -hmm. All right. But in 15 minutes, there's going to be an active shooter. Mm -hmm. And we can't have a meeting to decide who's going to do what. Mm -hmm. So how, how do other organizations, such as the church, have there been any who have maybe taken some, taken some steps? You can also be extreme on the whole issue, too, mm -hmm. but uh, to the fact that everybody's paranoid. But uh, what, what have you found in Grand Haven? Has anyone said, well, as I said to Hank here, mm -hmm. he has to get the first year 
chair and I don't get the second chair. Well, you know, but, <laughs> He's like, I don't want the first chair. You know, or, or who's going to rush the door? Yeah. You, can't, you can't have a meeting on that. Yeah, and, and a very good point. Um, and if, could everybody hear his question? So, you know, we always, when we say, hey, you call 911, get the AED for CPR, everybody's like, oh, it's not my business. I don't do it. No one calls, no one gets it. Um, so a lot of times it's easier when we assign people. Um, we have found, and this is what I was asking, like your security team, you know, um, some churches, like our, our security team at our church, we've got the police officers, we've got the veterans, we've got um, the doctor, um, we've got all sorts of walks of life on a security team. And we have someone that's assigned to sit in the back. We have someone that's assigned to sit in the front. Um, it's just pre-planning um, because it's kind of like law enforcement. We have one incident and we've got 50 different scenarios for that one incident. And so it's really hard to plan for that one incident. Um, and without making you paranoid, right, um, you could go to the extreme where everybody's a suspect. Um, but some of it is just trying to plan for the, the big one, and a lot of it's just seating. If we had something in here, a lot of it's seating placement. That's why if you look at law enforcement officers, we always sit with our backs towards the wall. We always sit at the back of the room. We always sit facing the door, you know, because we want to make sure and we want to be able to see everything, you know. Um, so I can't tell you what's going to work here. Um, I know that we're going to actually walk through the church um, and another time just to try to give some suggestions and ideas. Um, but if I would rather have everybody react and grab chairs and grab stools and barricade doors than no one act at all. Because he may not be here next Sunday when it happens. Or the three people that you assign to barricade the door may be sick and they're not here. And so as a congregation, I would hope that you would have at least 20 people that would be willing to grab chairs um, instead of three people, you know. Um, but some of it's just placement in different areas where you can see, you know, and, and it's prevention. It's a lot of it's just about prevention. So does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh. This is more of a comment. Most of the congregation doesn't know, but the facilities committee has a safety team. And they have worked with the graduate department. We've had some training as a facilities and church thing. So this is just part of everybody training. But there are people who are, that's why we lock the doors, okay? It came out of this, that 10 minutes after the service starts, all doors, but those doors are locked, okay? That came out of the safety training. So there is, the facilities committee is working on this and continue to work on it. So, so we're not on, yeah. well, there's nobody here that has to worry that we don't have somebody caring about it, but we can always do more, okay? Yeah. But just yeah. to let you know. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't even get in. I had to jimmy a window to get in. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, no, and, and I will say our, our city, you know, we're not immune to a lot, but I will say that um, we've been very proactive in businesses and churches, and, and you guys are also, it doesn't fall on deaf ears, so um, you're doing as much as you can, but again, you want this to be a safe place, right? So, good. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Quick comment. I just wanted to make sure I said um, Are most of the active shooter incidents done by one individual? Or are there multiple individuals? Yeah, very good question. So uh, the FBI, um, they, there's not one specific, uh, we'd love to say that it's a male between the age of 18 to 23 that has played video games that sits in the basement, right? Um, but there is not one size fits all. Um, and besides Columbine, um, Columbine, there was a two person um, crew, but for the rest of them, it's all been individual. Um, but that's not always the case. But what the FBI did find, though, is that um, they have at least told seven other people their plan, and those people have not reported it. So this is why we're pushing that if you see something, say something, um, because, uh, again, FBI statistic, 86% of these active, active shooter events could have been prevented if someone would have actually reported their friend. And that's how sad this is, because no one wants to make it their business. Last one, Vicky. Yes, uh, one quote to summarize, I think what I hear you saying is, the body will never go where the mind has never been. That's a Navy SEAL quote, and I Correct. think that's really good for all of us to think about what will we do in a situation where this might occur. We have a whole bunch of unused hymnals in here. Mm -hmm. Put them over your vitals. And then the, also, the last comment I have is, that, that room where the least number of people perished, 
they exhibited collective altruism. They all banded together to a task and put their feet against the door. I think more, more of us could do that. I think that's a really great character trait that I heard from your speech. Thank you. You just said it way better. And this is, yeah, so thank you. I'm going to write that down. Thank you. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I hope everyone has a safe Sunday. Enjoy the weather. And thank you very thank you. much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I just want to give a little um, heads up for next week is our um, local genealogist from the Laudit Library coming, Jeanette Wyden, and they are actually having a, um, on Wednesday at 2 p.m. at the Laudit Library, they're um, having the author, Libby Copeland, of the book The Lost Family about genealogy uh, research and stuff. So if you're interested in that field, you can do that as a precursor. Yes, I have to leave early from knitting. Thank you all. <laughs>